He's definitely brutal, he's always savage, and you're definitely getting wrecked. In late June of this year, Paul Challoner, also known and perhaps better known as his gaming alias Red Eye, walked away from esports seemingly for good. He made a public statement which came on the heels of allegations regarding his professional behaviour and scandalous supposed revelations about his personal life. Now, I think that is such a sorry way for one of the icons of this space to depart from it. Not in a manner of his choosing or with the fanfare that his actual career and accomplishments deserved, but basically almost fleeing from attacks many of them unverified and of a very damning nature that just tarnish a man's character, who he is as a person, not even what he accomplished. So we'll address all of this, and this is going to be a difficult video for anyone. For someone who hates Red Eye, you're going to hear things you don't want to hear that might start to make you think differently. For people who love Red Eye, you might not like that. I'm going to drag some of this up again. I'm going to reference some of it. Or I'm going to tell maybe some details you don't know about my own experiences with Red Eye. But the point is, I'm going to give you my perspective on Red Eye, context of his career, and I'm going to explain to you why his legacy is not those allegations or those things said about him. His legacy is the work that he did, the body of work he put together, the craft that he embodied, and quite frankly, the memories he gave us as esports fans. So let's talk first of all about the professional allegations. So the claims, which were publicized by James Banks, a well-loved interviewer and commentator in the scene, and someone who has, like, a, at this point in time, an extensive history himself, like over 10 years in the industry, but usually at much lower levels, and more recently kind of gotten his flowers and gotten his time in the sun, as it were. His claims painted red eye, I mean, let's just, be, let's just be straight up with it, as a selfish bully who ruled the companies he was involved with and spaces that he was occupying with intimidation tactics, even potentially the threat of violence with one incident being noted. And said incident claimed, which was mentioned in the in Banks's statement, that Red Eye had actually physically assaulted someone while working for Gfinity and I believe it was 2015. Now, the supposed victim of that assault also, later came forwards and provided or seemingly corroborated some of those details. Notice I'm using very particular language here. Alleged, supposed, seemingly. We'll get to this. So here's my take on that aspect. Because obviously this, this whole aspect that Banks wrote about his story, about how he felt intimidated and he had his anxiety flaring up when he was working red eye and he felt pushed around and he couldn't speak up. I don't dispute it. Any of Banks' story in that regard. I actually know Banks. I'd consider him a friend. We're not super tight, but I'd consider him a friend. He's been a good acquaintance when I've worked with him. I've even had him work under me before this time period. So I think I know the man somewhat. It all sounds plausible. I even think of some of my own interactions with Red Eye and other things I've seen or heard. And you know what? The majority of it sounds like what it appears to be an eyewitness account, but with the colours painting it supplied by Banks' internal feelings and perceptions. My only major issue with his telling of the story is potentially the part about him changing Banks' role because, I mean, that's basically, you're essentially rewriting a contract, right? You're restructuring part of a company. A contract which, by the way, likely had a termination clause, I'm going to guess. The rest of it, though, and this is the issue, took place in James Banks' head. Like, Red Eye can't necessarily even know some of that and may not even be aware that things were being coloured that way to Banks and that was how he was perceiving what was happening. Now, that is an issue. This also might hurt some people's feelings. That I'm going to say, I've seen that issue come up again and again with a lot of public allegations made in many different regards in our industry. And it's not invalidating the person's feelings and perceptions and their real lived experience to point out that those things may not have been communicated at all. The other person may not have been able to pick up on that at all. And they may not have actually even given any hints that some of these things were going on. They might have just been locked. I mean, you hear about people when they're in situations where they feel intimate, they just feel locked inside their own mind. They're just almost like a, a prisoner in the back of a cell watching something happening and they can't even interact with it. So yes, that all sounds terrible. But how's the other person supposed to know? They're not, we're not mind readers. So I will just say this. I've personally met a number of younger talents in my particular field, CSGO analysis, who later confessed to me that the first time they met me, they were scared shitless. They thought I would just wreck them with banter, make fun of every little detail, or if they slipped up once, I'd mock them as an idiot. Or to, And I, I remember thinking, well, first of all, I wouldn't do that, but I could never have picked up on that dude. Like, you were smiling, you were, you were laughing along with us, you were talking about things. I, I would have thought the guy was fine. I would have thought, if anything, he's enjoying. Maybe maybe he looked up to us and he's, he's, it's fun to be in the room with us suddenly and be part of working with us. 
Now, in terms of the contract part, that is no small matter to overlook if you don't know this industry. Like, I'm going to go ahead and guess in light of the role that Red Eye had, essentially in head, ahead of the production and the product, he could probably just let Banks go, especially if he didn't like him as a person or his work. These are freelance contracts we're talking about. They all come with a, a termination clause. Usually the termination clause, by the way, is just like essentially for any reason, either side can terminate in like 30 days notice. So he could have just said to Banks, you know what? I've only just got AC, get the next event. I'm going to use it you and after that you're fired. Well, he didn't do that though, as far as I know, right? I think he still kept him on for some work. It just wasn't in the role that Banks wanted. Now that's a totally separate matter. And that's also, in my opinion, you can make it public. I'm not going to police what you say, but... I don't really know that it's necessarily applicable to this particular case where what you're doing is painting red eye as somebody who's like abused his power or manipulated you in some sense. I would also guess, by the way, that yeah, you know what? Banks probably did get the bad side of red eye on a bunch of occasions. His time with Gfinity, I'm talking about red eyes here, was clearly in my own speculation, which by the way comes from knowing him professionally and personally for a number of years, I'm talking like a decade or so now, up close and afar. Yeah, you know what? That wasn't the best and most happy period of his career, the most successful period, the one he's the proudest of. It was a step down as far as I'm concerned from working with ESL, industry leaders, one of the best companies in the entire world for running events. And when he'd been there, he'd been managing some of the biggest tournaments in the world, ones that will be remembered in history. Think of the EMS one, kind of it say that Virtus Pro one. Think of some of those StarCraft tournaments that like 100k winner takes all one. Th these were incredible competitions. Even if the Gfinity role maybe came with more responsibility or he had more input or opportunity to shape the product, I just don't imagine that it had the same satisfaction. I think there's a reason why he was somewhat unhappy in that role, as well as other aspects in his life. You know, he'd been in the industry a long, long time. I'll even say this, as I alluded to before. My only experiences with Red Eye was that he was a tough boss. He demanded, when I worked for Gfinity, that we came in much earlier than I thought we needed to, hours and hours early in case something went wrong. He asked very long days of us, hours which, again, if I was to contrast to what people would say, like, it's a normal job or, like, the hours that you're supposed to make an employee, yeah, it'd be considered completely unacceptable. But that was also the industry that we were in. And when we were there, he didn't want us to veer too far with certain comments or in certain areas. And he was, wasn't exactly mincing his words when he told us that. He made himself very clear. But you know what? I also found that when he saw excellence and high performance and great work being done, that he appreciated it and he understood it. And that's not as common in this industry as you'd hope. It's actually quite rare, I've got to say. There's a lot of people there who are producers, camera guys, guys who are running products where at the end of it all, they could have put in a guy half as good. And as long as he said words and as long as there was no dead end, as long as he got to the break and the ads were played, they'd go, yeah, good job. Right, well done, guys. Let's all have sandwiches. And you know what? They'll never have the best productions. I'll tell you that right now. That's from my personal experience and my judgment. So coming from a background, which Red Eye did, of being the guy in front of the mic, he expected a lot, just as he'd expected a lot from himself. Those broadcasts represented him in the world. He no longer was the one on camera, but he was crafting what you saw on camera. Now, listen, yeah. There are way nicer ways to say things. And there are feelings to be taken account of if you want your t colleagues to also feel like they enjoy their work or feel happy about themselves or maintain high self-esteem morale. This is an area where clearly as a leader, he failed. But you know what? Let's just consider some of the context because it isn't always that easy trying on one hand, achieve excellence and greatness and push people. And on the other hand, Make everyone feel lovely and, and respected and appreciated. This isn't a family setting. This is work. So I would just suggest, by the way, I'm seeing parallels already with Steve Jobs. And you know what? As much as there's a million horror stories that he's one of the worst bosses ever, some of the people he was that terrible to acknowledged they would have never broken through to levels of greatness they didn't even know were possible if he hadn't have employed some of those tactics. Does that mean I would do it that way? Especially not as a more mature man. I would hope I wouldn't. But I can recognize within it that there were intentions there that were pure and they were to accomplish excellence. And unfortunately, there were casualties along the way. And people aren't going to want to hear that again. But those are people who are not striving for greatness. That is all I will say on that matter. So consider some of the context here. Something no one did when all these allegations came up. Remember, some of these were from 2014, for fuck's sake or even from years earlier. Red Eye was under immense pressure, as well as the casters at those events. And those are events where I would speculate he might have gotten 
two to four hours a night sleep. Maybe he didn't even sleep some nights. I mean, I would get four to five hours sleep at these events and feel like, oh, fuck this, I feel terrible. And he was staying longer than me and there before I got there and working on things overnight. So when Banks talks about his mental health issues, yeah, I feel for the guy. I empathize as someone who myself has been in tough situations. But does he not realize that, you know what, Red Eye had his own. And Red Eye has, in fact, spoken about them since publicly, unprompted, not in response to something like this, to try and like, apologize for it or make it not seem... No, no, he, he just absolutely came out on his own dime and essentially tried to make it the case, just like Henry G did with caster conditions, of like, listen, I'm at the top of the field. So guys, if you guys are struggling with this, understand, I I'm going through it as well. Like, this is a tough situation. And by laying himself bare in some ways like that, I'm sure a lot of people realize, holy shit, it ain't just me. Everyone's having these problems. Like, this is a brutal industry that we're living in right now. This isn't the promised land of esports yet. We're still going through the wilderness skies. And we're going to be here for 40 years. This is tough. These are the hard yards. And it ain't for people who want a hug and a kiss on the cheek all the time. I'm sorry. It isn't. Or if you do want to do that, you're going to be part of broadcasts that aren't the best. I'll tell you that right now. I've known some of the greatest people in this industry. And there's a reason why they kept walking through the fire when they were getting burned. So... I could even see a world where if they actually had been able to speak about these issues, like if Banks had at the time had the courage to come to Red Eye and say, I don't like the way this is going and even if it means you fire me, mate, I've got to tell you like the way you treat me. So I think, you know what, if they could have opened up to each other, maybe this couldn't have happened. This is a hypothetical, it's an ideal world. I think they maybe could have even bonded over it or built a better relationship, come together a little bit over it, would have understood each other. That's the key thing. When you express your experience... Now you sort of know where the guy comes from, whether you agree with it, whether you like it or not, you, you get a little bit more of a sense of what that person's about. It's not just as simple as a sentence or one color shade that you're going to paint it all in. There's a lot of gray area in these matters. I would also say, by the way, I'm sorry, but in terms of how that was all presented, and I've had horrible times working with people as well. I'm even going to talk about it later. I have to say, if I have to pick a camp, which I don't, but just to make a point, I'm more in the red eye vein of thought when I say that they can, having issues like that and having films where you feel like you can't speak up is not an excuse. As in, certainly it's something that goes on, it's context that we should know, but it's not something that means that then everything else doesn't matter and that because you felt that way, doesn't matter how you worked or what role you were doing or what the rest of the broad, because that's not the industry that we were in. These sorts of difficulties are an obstacle to overcome. They're a problem to work with. They're a consideration at all times, certainly. But they are never an excuse for failure in performance or work. Like, I always used to tell people this when I was their boss or when I was working as a colleague. I used to say this, listen, if you apologize, I appreciate it on a personal level, the sentiment. But rather than just apologize, I'd appreciate it more if you just didn't do it next time. That's what will really show me and really help further this relationship. But some people think once they apologize or once they've got an excuse... Now, they can't be held culpable for anything. They have no responsibility. They have no part in anything else that happened. And that is not the business we're in. That is not the craft we are in, gentlemen. So let's talk about this. Because you know what? This is a results business. As much as the players are in a results business, there's no time to hold people's hand. There are literally dozens of prospective talents, just as there would be players, who will perform if you put them in that person's spot. The person who's having these issues. If I'm the football manager of a top European football team, I can't just take a talented striker who's shown so much promise, but then under me, give him like two, three seasons where he's not scoring enough, he's not creating chances, he's clearly having issues off the field, maybe he's got a rough personal situation. Because you know what? That will cost me and eventually him his job. It's irresponsible for both of us and it's not what we're there for. And it doesn't align with reaching for greatness. So you know what? Let's tell a little personal story that you don't know. When Red Eye fired me from EMS1 Kadavice, the second CSGO major, because of the comments I made on the talk show, some jokingly, but some just, yeah, in mean-spirited, of course, on the undis on unfiltered talk show the night before, StarCraft 2 and General Esports show, I wasn't pleased with how it was handled. I wasn't pleased with the nature of how he fired me. But I've never spoken on it extensively or much in public, quite frankly. And there's a reason why. Because first of all, I actually acknowledge and did at the time that my comments were insensitive, particularly to the host nation that was actually bringing me in, welcoming me in to work in their country. And also, I felt like it took away some of the spotlight from what should have been a celebration of epic Counter-Strike at the World Championship, something we'd only just got the second proper World Championship for Valve endorsed in almost Counter-Strike history. But it was the way I was fired. 
yeah, you know what? That did make me feel as though I was hung out to dry and scapegoated. And that some of it came from Red Eye and maybe resentment between me and him. We weren't friends at the time. We we hadn't worked together very many times. We'd just been around in the industry. And this is one of our first comings together, as it were. And I do think, quite frankly, I'm just gonna be I'm just gonna be totally blunt with this, that the statement that he wrote, or at least he penned and put his name on, that he and ESL went too far. And that they went basically as close as they could to the line of explicitly saying something by implying that I was some bigot of some flavor, like I was xenophobe, racist, whatever. You pick whatever term people love to throw around nowadays without explicitly tying it to me. But basically, if you understand the way language and subcommunication works, essentially saying it. it's one of the reasons why I will never fully accept Carmack's apology that he's tried to attempt to make later on where he does this bullshit bait and switch where he claims that actually they never meant to imply any of those things in that. When they were making a statement about me being fired, that putting in a whole paragraph right afterwards about how they'll never accept xenophobia and racism, etc. that that wasn't even supposed to be related to me. That was just a general comment. Like, nah, it doesn't work that way, mate. You, you can, listen, you, you can sell that to the plebs. You can sell that to the birds. You're not going to sell that to someone who understands the way that language works and understands the field of journalism and communication, my mate. You're not going to do it. I understand the intention behind that. I've also done my due diligence. I, I've gone and corroborated stories and, I know exactly what was going on in that situation. I've even talked about it in the past. So likewise, when I was at Gfinity, you know what? Put me on three to four hours sleep. You're also not going to tell me stuff about the tone of the broadcast except with no pushback whatsoever. I'm not just going to take it on. By the way, in that scenario, no matter how I feel, I'm going to speak what I think. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to stand my ground sometimes. That was the world we were in back then. And that's the reason why people like me and Red Eye endured. And by the way, help build a fucking industry for some of you people who are now going to judge us when you never lived that life. You didn't walk in our shoes. You ain't about that life. So now let's talk about the physical altercation, right? First and foremost, that is a police matter. That is how that should be handled. And yet that does not appear to have ever been made a police matter, as far as I can tell. So then how serious was it for that individual? That's not for me to judge, but it's a question I think must be asked. If this was something that was so outrageous and unacceptable, and by the way, I would consider a physical assault like that. I think you should go to the police with that matter. I don't think you should keep it and then essentially anonymously claim, I'm that guy and here's what happened. Like, that, ah, that's fucked up. Like, that's just to hurt a person's character and feelings, quite frankly. You're not about justice at all when you do that. You're not trying to even bring the person to justice. You're just trying to make everyone hate them. You're trying to actually manipulate people into potentially making decisions about working with them that they wouldn't make, by the way, even if that was a police matter, and even if the person actually paid for their crime and had some sort of a punishment. I'm, I'm not fucking with that whatsoever. So, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and say this. And this is another part of the people's feelings. Get ready. You ain't going to like this, these sacred cows being God. I'm getting sick of this line that I keep hearing over and over again. It goes like this. But if I speak out, then it might affect my career. Not least because the operative word is always might. They don't even know for sure. It's not even like they've been threatened. They haven't spoken up and the person says, listen, you fucking say something like that again, I'll end you. That's not even often what's happened in this case. Like certainly Banks pointed out some other cases where some of that had, and I think that is unacceptable. That is an area where Red Eye did fuck up if him and people from his agency took part in that and would essentially blackmail him. Yeah, that's totally unacceptable. And that should probably carry a punishment. And maybe you can only up that in the industry. There is no police to go with for some of that, right? But the reason why I say that is these individuals are acting like they never had a choice when they explicitly did have a choice and are actually articulating to you that they made the choice. They just don't seem to understand it. They made the choice then and there to tell you that they have a hierarchy of concerns. And number one on that is that they must keep doing the same job with the same working conditions without any of the discomfort of actually coming forward and explaining that they don't like what's happening. And then rather than take action, which, yeah, might harm them. You know what? It might help them as well. It might help other people as well. Like that could actually help future employees. That could create an environment where that sort of behavior doesn't happen. Or it could expose that that's what happens when you work for that company. I'll tell you something. There's no guarantee it will hurt you. You can't say you read someone's mind. Unless you've got cases like they threatened you, you can't say that. That's in your mind again. So I'll say this right now. If you sell your dignity and your morale for a paycheck, then you made a deal with the devil inside yourself. It was only inside yourself. And I have my questions about that. Because until you respect yourself, others often won't. That is a key lesson for everyone to learn. And I'll say this right now. I've been in many scenarios where, yeah, I ate shit and just continued on. But one of the things I realized when I finally decided I'm not going to do this for one second more in my life, my life improved. I found my way to working with the right people. I got away from bad situations. I helped others get away from bad situations. And I realized the part I played 
in that cycle of, you can call it here, just abuse, whatever you want to fucking call it, harassment. And these are, these are all pretty extreme terms when we're, we're talking sometimes just about saying stuff like, oh, I'm going to move you to another job because I don't think you're good enough. Like, I have my issues with a lot of this topic. Secondly, this individual didn't make their identity public and we have no corroboration, again, from any source, by a verified by a respected journalist, to suggest that this altercation actually happened. I'd also heard this story from people at Gfinity, a bunch of them. But you know what? I can't know if that's some company ghost story of the guy that they all hate and have scapegoated for the bad times. Like, I've heard enough barefaced and mean-spirited lies about myself in this industry that I'll always give people the benefit of the doubt until I see some sort of proof or credible corroboration of the story. I do consider Banks a friend, but he was not the one who he is alleging was assaulted. Now, listen... If you did physically assault someone, then it would also depend on the circumstances. Oh, have I just gone and said that out loud? Because I'm not going to take fucking bullshit. I'm a man. Those are my actual thoughts. So here, let's go down that road, shall we? It might shock you, but there's context to every scenario, including physical altercations. They don't just pop out of thin air in most cases. I'm reminded of Richard's altercation with Loder, which has haunted him and been albatross around his fucking neck because people who cannot accomplish a a scintilla of the greatness that that man has put into this industry want to drag everything down by just saying, well, I didn't do that one thing that you did very specifically, which I'm going to just destroy the context of. Fuck you. These are people, Lorde and Richard, they'd verbally sparred already. Lorde escalated matters with very passive-aggressive ma communication, which sub-communicated like, I might fuck you up. I might do something to you. Was trying to put the threat out there in the sub-communication. That's the intention I got, and I know Richard did. Then came to where Richard was working while he was working, walked up to Richard while saying things aggressively, put his face into Richard's face and touched it with his face. Now, I wasn't born in Sweden to Lorda's family. I don't know his culture. So I can only tell you what happens when you do that to someone from the background Richard and myself hail from. I tell you what, they don't do what Richard did, which is push you back on your neck, leave a very light pink mark on your neck, and then immediately everything just dissipate, and then the police deal with it and say, you know what, actually, let's just file this report in the bin. This isn't really an assault. There's nothing to do here. I'd rather we just didn't go proceed with it. Tell you what they do. You're not going to like this. They punch your fucking head in and make sure you are entirely neutralized as a threat because you essentially just made a potential threat on their life. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you aren't about this life. You didn't live in those places. You didn't take beatings from people for nothing. You didn't have people where if you even made a, a snide remark, they fuck you up. You didn't experience that. So you don't know that world. So in the same sense, everyone out there wants us to consider the feelings and the experience and the background of the person they're considering the victim. They're ignoring what happened on the other side of that equation, how this situation came to be. And you notice I didn't make an excuse for anyone, but I'm telling you why the situation went the way it went. And so I'll just say right now, and this is a very valuable lesson a lot of people need to, especially pro players could learn. You don't ever go in a man's face and attempt to intimidate him physically if you do not want a physical altercation to occur. Not because I'm telling you I want it to occur, but because I'm telling you in some cases it will occur. So you have to understand part of the role that you're playing within potentially creating that. So if you don't want that, make sure you never go down that path. You never escalate the behavior. To give an analogy, it's like if you went up to someone, you drew a gun on them and you told them, you better do what I say. The implication is, or I will kill you. Now, in that scenario, you've just threatened a man's life with deadly force. And you know what? By all rights, he can now consider as a viable option that he might have to use deadly force against you as a real solution to a very intense, chaotic, fast-moving and alarmingly escalated situation, which you played a part in escalating. So the problem with all of this and this whole scenario of did he punch the guy is it would depend on the nature of their argument and what the other individual did or if there were any physical components. Well, like we don't know if that guy was pushing him or if he said something fucked up about his wife or something. I'm purely speculating. I'm pointing out that it's not as simple as him going, oh, Red Eye, I didn't appreciate that. And then Red Eye just diving over a table and fucking headlocking him and pushing it and punching his face. And like, I don't know what happened, but I'm telling you, we need to know the context before we can judge. We have to know where these people come from, what happened and what led to it? What was the series of events? What was the chronology? So let's just be real. We're not robots. And let's not pretend we're saints either. Also, here's a very key point I noticed very few people seem to bring up because they obviously just didn't like Red Eye. 
Red Eye, as he showed in his statement, had logs where he had apologized to said individual who he claims he didn't actually physically assault, but he had a heated argument with. And that individual accepted his apology. I think he even said, oh, thanks for that or whatever. But that same individual was supposed to believe. Later, claim out, didn't mention that, restated it all as if it was fresh. What the fuck is that? When you accept the man's apology, man to man, and you say that, your, your word is all that you were as good as. So if you then come back later, oh, I'm going to now come out like, fuck you. Listen, you might have actually been assaulted. If so, I certainly feel for you. But that doesn't allow you to then just fuck around with the truth and you use the lie of omission to leave out key context. Nah, I ain't fucking with that either. So aside from the alleged assault, Red Eye's main crime, laughable as it is to call it that, unless we're talking about a physical assault, is essentially that he was an over-demanding boss, or he was egotistical, or he was crass in dealing with people's feelings and maybe didn't care about them sometimes because he only cared about the health of the broadcast or the product that he was putting out. Well, you know what? Red Eye would agree with you. He even did in his departing statement. Here's a quote. He said, do I have an ego? Yep. No, it's no excuse. Does it get out of control sometimes? Yes. No excuse again. Have I tried to work on this? Absolutely. He's even spoken, as I referenced earlier, about his mental health. He even, by the way, was very frank. And I, was, I thought very brave by revealing that he had insecurities about younger and newer talent coming up and taking jobs from him or doing things he thought he could do. You know, that self-awareness is key. That's what shows you we're not dealing with someone evil here. That's what shows that he isn't some sociopath who was just calculated and manipulating everyone and then wallowing in their suffering or laughing at what pain he could inflict upon them because he was the winner in it. All. No, this was a human being. And it was a, guy, it was a guy, yeah, he was a complicated guy, very intense guy. And he was a guy who fucked up, but he was a guy who also achieved great things. So let's address one more aspect of that, which is the PGL aspect, which was an event at the end of last year that I did. It was the CSGO Asia Championship or whatever the fuck that tournament's called. Now, it was claimed that he was way too harsh on the people he was working with. Well, you know what? I was at that event and I was a colleague of Red Eyes for that event. And you know what? Yeah, he was very tough. And with some of those people, he was brutal in a way they would have never experienced before and never expected. But they were also unaccepted, unacceptably shit in some areas of their job that impacted us constantly. And so I was angry and disappointed and frustrated with what was going on as well. It's just that my solution would just be, well, I'm not fucking working with these people again next year. Or I'm going to tell their boss, if that guy's ever there again, I'm not working there again. Red Eye, because he comes from a production background, much as, by the way, other industry icons like Sir Scoots have done, he went back there and he thought, I can improve this by giving someone to tell him to. Telling them what they're fucking up. Telling them they better fix this right now and make the event better. By the way, not just for himself, but for me as well, potentially. So it wouldn't be the way I'd handle it, but... I, I respect the approach, at least, if not maybe the words used and the nature of how he did it. So I'll just tell you right now, I'm friends with Silvio from PGL. I think this guy's a G. I love some of the things he's accomplished. He's another OG in this industry who deserves way more. He should be in a fucking Hall of Fame tomorrow. But you know what? For that event, he was running some other event, I think some daughter event maybe in Europe. And as a result, he sent his B or C team, the replacements, some people who'd never done certain jobs, to go and do that event. And some of them were incompetent people. So since this was outed in terms of red-eye getting I'm going to have to out this aspect. Yeah, they were incompetent. Some of those people should never have been doing that job, especially not with the tier one talent that they'd hired. And I've got no time for that. That isn't something I fuck with whatsoever. And that is not any slight to Silvio himself. I think he just stretched himself way too thin and underestimated how hard it was going to be to run an event in China with people from fucking Romania. Can you see where there's not much of an overlap culturally there, guys? And in terms of the way things are done procedurally. Let's understand something about red-eye's background. Red Eye comes from a world few listening to this will ever be able to understand. Where you did events for free on your own dime, so not even for free, you lost money, to get your foot in the door and try and get it so that in the future it could become a job. Because this was your dream. It was a craft driven solely by personal passion. And because you wanted it to be more than even the people hiring you probably thought it could be. Then he had the era where he just made pennies compared to what we make now. While trying to support in the United Kingdom with the cost of living there, a wife and family. I could imagine the strain in his personal, uh, in his private life probably exceeds anything that those of us who are bachelors complain about jet lag and late payments will ever understand. I actually feel for the guy, even though I know I can't ever understand that. Then he helped build a significantly better industry that we talent now benefit from, to the tune, by the way, of six-figure incomes, something he couldn't even have dreamed of, and mass exposure for our brands and being critically, people being on Forbes lists and doing interviews with the biggest outlets in the world. 
That doesn't happen without red eye. So, you know what? Let me just say this right now, because this actually highlights the fact that we stand on the shoulders of giants. In the next few years, a commentator or a host, maybe it's a Shocks, a Golden Boy, Henry G, is going to sign a million dollar deal. Mark my words. And I would suggest that all of that might be another decade away without the efforts of guys like Red Eye and the and they're, yeah, at, at times ruthless and unyielding professional approach to push it forwards in the same way as Steve Jobs accelerated certain technology being adopted by the public, probably by decades again with his particular way. So you know what? When you guys are watching that awesome documentary on Netflix, The Last Dance, about the 90s Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan, who everyone loves, you know what? If you can appreciate Michael Jordan and how hard he was, but how it led to greatness, then spare a thought for Red Eye. Because as Michael Jordan said in that particular documentary, I never asked them to do anything I didn't do myself. And that is the thing with Red Eye. He was there. He did it all. He did more than you. He had a harder time. He asked a lot of you. He knew that we had to get to a high level. And it wasn't just going to be all friendly smiles along the way. That isn't where we are at in this industry right now. And if you fuck up, it's a results business. And he's going to let you know. Because you're fucking his job up as well there. Just as if someone plays shit in the Chicago Bulls game in the playoffs, that's costing Michael Jordan a potential championship. And he's only going to get so many in his career. So that reflects badly on him. Now, you know what? Those guys go too far sometimes. Even Michael Jordan. Especially when it, sometimes it comes to payment and conditions. Like, I've made this point in the past. Like, sometimes they go a bit too far, in my opinion, trying to belabor the fact that it was worse in their time and they didn't get paid as much and they wouldn't have dared ask for this and you've only just been in the industry wanted to. Sometimes I think they go too far in that way and they do, to some degree, strangle or make it a bit tougher or inhibit some of the newer talents. Yeah, I think that's something he might even admit himself. I'm not sure I've never spoken about that. So I understand, though, this is the thing that the talent never do. I understand the resentment that these people are entitled, that they don't understand what you went through, that they just expect things and they don't really seem to know how to pay their dues for what came before them. So I'll contrast it to pro players. I know they have a similar feeling. Think about guys like Nip, where Nip was in a top four placing of something like the first 23 tournaments they played in. Nip and Fnatic won majors when the first place prize for winning a whole major was $100,000. Then they look in 2018 and they see Astralis winning $500,000 first place majors. Seemingly every event has a $250,000 prize pool, six figures for first place. They used to play to win a tournament that had 50,000 total prize money in it. And they had to kill themselves to beat the best in the world to do that. So you know what, if you're in their position, yeah, you know what, part of you looks it and you wishes that was you, that you'd had the chance to have your efforts credited and rewarded financially so in that particular case. And you feel like you didn't get your due in the same way as a basketball player in the 70s who might have been really great. Sees now like a guy who's a draft bust, but a high pick, get millions of dollars in contract. Think, fuck, what? I didn't even get anything. I was in the MVP. If you were a guy like Elgin Baylor, how, how bad must it be for someone like that? It was a god. And then look what they got from it. Next to nothing. It was like having a, a really nice part-time job almost. So... If you paved the way for those people, like those players did, like those teams did, like Red Eye and the casters did, then yeah, you're going to feel a little bit like, I want you to at least acknowledge this, guys. And maybe that went too far. I think it probably did in some cases. Now, in terms of his personal life and the supposed revelations that we got about it, which involved his family and a court case surrounding them, I'm going to say this right now, and I'm not going to mince my words at all. That had no business being made public in that particular fashion. I don't care if technically you could somehow access those court documents. Don't play dumb and act like that's the same as broadcasting it over a medium where people never would find out or even think to go and look for those, in theory, public documents. So that guy coming forward, a guy came forward who claimed it was like anonymous, but he claimed he was on the jury there and he's going to reveal some details about it. That guy is a fucking disgrace. And by the way, could well have committed a crime. Go and look it up in the UK. If you come out and you reveal details about a case where you were on the jury, they say you can mention things about like your part, but you're not supposed to mention details about the case. I'll also add in again, it was hearsay because nobody can corroborate that that person is who he said he was. And even if they could, that actually those things were said. We'd need other people from the jury who were corroborated to come forwards and cross-reference the things that were said and all the rest of it. So I thought that was such dirty character assassination. And I'll say right now, as a general principle and rule in life, never cross the line of a man's family in that manner. It has nothing to do with the story. It's just character assassination along the lines of like, isn't this guy a total cunt? So maybe he did all the things I said. If the things you did. Here's the thing. I love that quote. I think it's like a C.S. Lewis quote. The truth is like a lion. 
If you set it free, it doesn't need protecting. It'll take care of itself. You don't have to hedge it and take out content. You don't have to do any of that or add in some other shit. Like, oh, look, he's fucking ugly as well. Like, you don't have to do any of that shit to try and win the crowd. That's called sophistry. That is not actually reasonable argument. That's not that's not true right speech in the almost Buddhist sense. So I'll just say this about all those comments. No credible journalist ran with that story. Hence, by the way, why Banks himself came out with it, because he just felt like it had to be put out there. And by the way, it's up to him to tell his story. And one of the reasons, by the way, why no journalist came out with that is they either couldn't corroborate certain elements of it, or they thought they could be sued due to the nature of the stories and some of the details, and the fact that, again, a lot of it was based on hearsay. Then, let's just address the claims about his agency, Code Red Esports. Look, I was never repped by them, and so those are other people's stories to tell, and I'll let them stand as they were. But I will mention for context, I think most agencies in esports are bullshit, or at least semi-bullshit, and there is a lot of wild shit going on, a lot of it unethical, by the way, and way worse than some of the stuff I even saw mentioned there. I'll just say this, I was repped by the biggest agency, not esports agency, the biggest agency in the world, and I fired them because of some of the unacceptable, unethical behavior they engaged with, with me. And I'll leave it at that. So let's talk about Red Eye's legacy. I know it's brutal that so much of the video had to be about all the bad parts about it. But the point is, I hope you've listened to this point. Because now we're going to get to, in my opinion, the most important part of Red Eye's legacy. He was one of the best commentators this field has ever heard in his technical ability, in his experience and understanding of the craft, in just his raw talent, in the enthusiasm he put into the craft, in his in, in the spirit of how he did it and dedicated himself to it. I know he's a Murray Walker fan from racing. And you know what? I'll give him this credit. I think his voice approaches those levels of being iconic and intrinsically tied to the sport. This is a guy who started out when he had to be a multi-game guy and do a billion different games he hadn't even played or followed before. Then he built himself into the fabric of key games, Counter-Strike being one of them, but StarCraft and Dota must be mentioned. That in itself is incredibly hard. That's like having two separate careers. One is like a multi-game general guy who's just a cast. The other one, then he's working with analysts and top talents, and he's now he's working just in one field where they're all specialists and not again. That's two careers. It's like when people try to tell me that because I was here since the early days, that's why I'm here now. Now I'm here now because every year I went head-to-head -head with the best the world had to offer, and I beat them, and I kept working, and I kept achieving, and I kept improving, and I kept trying to figure out where I was fucking up, where they were doing things right, and where I could improve. And never, if I'd rest on my laurels, you wouldn't have heard of me past two. 2003 therefore you would never have heard of me you heard of me right now because i stayed relevant because i did the things that were necessary to become the person i needed to be to get to the level that i was at now which is light years beyond what i was at, at the beginning he also helped scout some of the talent at a number of companies who have gone on to become some of your favorite casters they were nobodies or they'd never done a big event before he brought them on he ran some of the most successful and biggest broadcasts think of the esl starcraft 2 tournaments that were some of the pinnacles of that game you had gfinity cs go events which by the way were one of the first events to truly embrace the banter angle it was the era when i was coming up with the gfinity's angels me richard scoots he then, as I alluded to before, reinvented himself to work with the top talents of this era. Let me just give you an analogy. That's like if Michael Jordan, when he came back for the Wizards, had been an MVP contender, as opposed to just a good player and a good player for 38, 39, and then given the, the stars of the day, Kobe, T-Mac, Allen Iverson, Vince Carter, if he'd just given them on a daily basis, like as much as they could fucking handle, that's what Red Eye did when he came back. So, you know what? In fact, you know what? Since I know Paul's a fan of racing, maybe I'll change it up. Here's the analogy for him. That's like if when, if Schumacher had come back and been able to compete head-to-head -head and be as good in the era of Vettel and Alonso or Hamilton. Wouldn't you revere them even more? Wouldn't you say they weren't just a champion? There's something special about this man. So, then let's just talk for a second about StarCraft 2 and Dota 2. The International is the biggest tournament, arguably, in the entire world of esports. And it is for an incredibly complex game, which has a burden of knowledge that I know means me and Red Eye are nowhere close to experts in the game. We're, like, very good for casual people, and we watched it, and we're fans. But if we worked on those events, we wouldn't be the raw expert, like Molini, Blitz, PPD. These people will, will probably never be at their level. We haven't even got the time or the inclination to put in that kind of effort. So the idea that he would go there but then play this pivotal side role, bringing life to the desk, a professional sheen for what, quite frankly, I thought was a desk that, re that actually contrasted before him quite poorly with other games and was inappropriate in terms of some of the casters they were having head the desk at times or people who were just fucking meme lords, which is inappropriate, in my opinion, for the World Championship. So 
The problem Dota has always had, I've always said it, is too many nerds analysing the games and not enough entertainment and sheen to go around it and deliver it. Not enough sugar to make the medicine go down. One of the reasons Red Eye was that good and endured that long is that he didn't get into his feelings every time something went wrong and people fucked with him. Maybe he did momentarily, maybe he did in private, but he didn't in terms of letting it hold him back. It was never an excuse. He gave back as good as he got, whether that's right or wrong. He kept ploughing on no matter what, no matter what. He drove himself to improve his casting, whether it was for $50, a tray of beer, or later for thousands and thousands of dollars and business class flights. And he drove others too. Because that's, listen, that's not the kind of leadership everyone's going to like. Just like some people didn't like playing with Michael Jordan. But I recognize the intentions of it and I understand them, whether I agree with them or not. None of which excuses bad behavior, by the way. But you know what? It explains how something is presented isn't the only defining quality it possesses. You must look beyond the surface. You must examine and learn the context before you even dream of passing judgment on another man, their life and their career. So this notion that your bad behavior destroys any accomplishment, it's fucking nonsense. And I'm not going to let it be perpetuated. Yeah, certainly bad behavior that's publicized and bad reputations, they will tarnish how people think of you. But if you won a championship as an arsehole, you were still a champion. If you were the best in your field and you were uncompromising, well, you were still the best. You can't and won't take that away from the people I respect on my watch. So I hope one day, and I've said this to him privately, I hope one day he'll come back, at least behind the scenes, because I think he could do so much there, so much good, help so many people improve, help things about this industry. He has literally priceless and invaluable experience and understanding that you can't replace with anyone now, no matter how good they are or no matter how lovely they may be for a hug and a kiss on the cheek. So I've said nowhere here in this video, that Red Eye should have been in the position of a boss, that he should have continued on, that we should ignore all of those things. No, no, I've said, consider what I'm saying as well. If and how he even should work again, I haven't even commented on. I've just said I'd like him behind the scenes to come forwards. I'm here to point out that there is so much more context to the man's career and his character. And some of you, I'll just give you an analogy. Some of you were pointing out stains on a fucking Rembrandt and then telling me that the artist was shit as a result and that there is nothing of value in the, what he created. I'll say this because it's something that I believe. Plato told you, the good, the true, and the beautiful. These are ideals we aspire to and cherish. So fucking cherish them. Is Schumacher no longer one of the greatest champions because he tried to cheat to win some of those champ titles? Not all of them, some of them. Was Senna an evil and careless dolt for risking his and other drivers' lives with his daredevil style? Or do we revere him for his flawed but unique drive to be the fastest? Would you judge a racer from the 50s or the 60s when you could straight up die at any moment as we would someone and how they drive in the 2020s? Context, context, context. Here's who Red Eye was. He was a talented, polished, Pioneer, demanding boss, sometimes overly, someone who cared about his work, the work of his colleagues, and what the fan got to experience at home. Give the man his due. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Spencer Green, What Are Things, Pranogo, Matt Schakowsky, Tobias Bernasconi, J Dobbs, Alexander Rao, Zinged, the Puyallup Tribe, Jensen Gore, Hades, Andreas Crockneys, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my boy Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you want to ask me a question in one of those video AMAs I do. Do you want teasers? Do you want to see who the next guests are on my shows? Do you want to take part in an in-depth esports discussion with moi? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today in the Patreon link in the description box below.